last Sunday, she said three things that we're talking about. We're targeting in prayer, church. Three things we're targeting in prayer. What were they? Say that again. Love it. Very good. Restoration of the house of prayer. What was another one? The Holy Spirit. New baptism of the Holy Spirit. Beautiful, yes. And? Yeah, praying up the children of glory. Very good. So last week, we took some time to reconsider the urgency, or to consider the urgency around our need to pray up the next generation as the children of glory. The question was, what what is your vision for their tomorrow? We know some of the statistics, we know some of the issues going on, but what's your vision? What's your hopes and dreams? What are you praying for? The enemy has a clear plan, a scheme for that generation, but what's our plan? What's our vision? What's our prayer? And the concept of the children of glory is a picture of a coming generation who would know the glory of God, who would know the voice of God, who would know the presence of God and the power of God like Moses did, like Samuel did, like Elijah did. Healings, miracles, revelation, the perfect love of God. These things would be their norm. Good prayer? All right. Well, I'm in. Our job is to pray, to equip, and to raise them in the context of a worshiping community of missional disciples. And that's what we're on. So today, I want to l- look at what this other term means about the restoration of the house of prayer for all nations. What does it actually mean? In Matthew 21, Mark 11, Jesus went to the temple and he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers? Interesting that he he said it's going to be called something. It's called a house of prayer. So under, to understand that term, we, we'd start with understanding the significance of the house of prayer. So we're going to have a look at some, uh, some scriptures in Genesis 28. You're welcome to turn there. I'll try and read through uh, on the screen as well. But uh, it's, a, it's a story of Jacob. So you remember that um, the world after the flood uh, started to turn into all sorts of Things and no doubt started to worship a lot of false gods and idolatry and all sorts of terrible things would have been happening. And so God separates out one man, Abraham, and says, out of this guy, I'm going to make a whole nation. I'm going to set them apart from all the other nations, and I'm going to reveal myself to them. They're going to know me, and I'm going to dwell with them. Well, that sounds awesome. And so Abraham had had a couple of sons. I won't go over the story. You'll be able to read that in Genesis. And one of them is Isaac. Isaac had the son Jacob. And Jacob meant supplanter or deceiver, which is not a great thing to call your kid. Um, but that's, that's what the story was. So his name was Jacob. And God was doing a work on the inside of Jacob, a transformative work. And there's quite a story there. But we come into Jacob's story in chapter 28. And uh, here's what happened. He's traveling, and he leaves Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, when he reached a certain place, a specific place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. Just note that the Lord there, I've put it in capitals, is it? I am the Lord. All right, so it's not in there, but in your Bible, sometimes the translations don't do a good job of this, but sometimes in your translations, they'll put the Lord in capitals. That means it's one of the personal, maybe the personal, or one of the names of God. So when it has a lower case, like it is up there, that can often mean like master and Lord, like an English Lord, but this isn't that. God is revealing his name, who he is to Jacob. So it's a bit more significant. 
I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. You're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, meaning many, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Wow. I guess that makes us kind of significant. If I was his dad, I, I would have thought that. I am with you and will watch over you and wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Here I was just having a snooze. I didn't realize Looked pretty normal to me. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, set it up as a, a pillar, and poured oil on it. He called that place Bethel or Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household. Then the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I'll give you a tenth. So church, Jacob had a revelation that we need. We need the same revelation. He arrived at a certain place, just a standard normal place in earthly tombs, until his eyes were open, He had a revelation to the significance of the place, the certain place he had stopped. He stopped right under an open heaven. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Before it was just an area, the district of Luz, normal land, normal plants, Normal sky, an average city, an average suburb, an average street. And then his eyes were open and he realized he was standing somewhere terrifyingly awesome. He's seen the heaven open and there's the activity of angels. And there is God standing at the top of the stairway. I can't imagine it. There's a few artist impressions. They don't do a very good job, I'm sure, of what he saw. Now, with his eyes opened, there was nothing normal about that place anymore, and now he was afraid standing in that place. As soon as he got up the next morning, he builds an offering, uh, builds an altar, brings an offering. He declares his absolute devotion to the God at the top of the stairwell. The Lord will be my God. In other words, the name, it's not just God, as in that's a common word used for the deity of any deity you're worshiping. It says that of all the gods on earth, this is going to be my God, the God at the top of the stairwell there, the Lord, Jehovah, he will be my God. Makes an offering there. He declares this is none other than Bethel, the house of God. The house of God, the gate of heaven, the place of the open heaven. What would you do if you'd found that? If you woke up one morning, you're out somewhere and found out, you'd just seen that vision, you thought, this is the place. Man, what would you do? Surely you'd just sell everything and buy that place. So we've got to do something here. There's an open heaven over this place. There's a stairwell where the angels are busy bringing stuff down and taking stuff up. I don't know what they're doing, but... God's there in that place. Hmm. Are you starting to get it? What place are you in this morning? It's just a place. The old gym. Is it? We're so familiar with the terms church and Sunday worship and house of God. So familiar that we can easily miss the significance of of what this is supposed to be. Maybe this question will help. When a church, this church, is planted in a place, 
Is it planted to be the house of God, or is it planted because the place is the house of God? That's a weird concept, isn't it? We're going to plant the house of God there. Are you sure? Or is the house of God there already, and you're just going to gather there to pray, to worship, to connect with God? That's what was going on with Jacob. He just thought it was a place. Eyes are open. This is not just any place. This is the house of God. Was there a building there? There's no building there. Was there a bed there? There's no bed. He used a stone for a pillow. There was nothing there. There was not a lovely palace. There was not a lovely temple. But he had a revelation, the house of God's here. It's a strange thing to say, isn't it? Because we just always think of in terms of the house of God being a building. Well, he was seeing something different. Now, we can easily get over-focused on geography and location. But as you, as you review Scripture, you find that God is quite specific about locations. Go back through the Old Testament, and you see this thing about locations, God taking people to places and important uh, places having a special significance. In the beginning, remember, God made the heavens and the earth, and you've seen some of the pictures of the stars of the universe, right? And where are we? Right in the middle? No, we're just a, an average galaxy in the universe. We're about to be in the galaxy. We're in the middle. It's a spiral one. No, we're not in the middle. We're just off to the side somewhere. Can you see where we are? No, you can't see. It's just an arm and a cluster of galaxies and stars. You zoom in a bit further and you find there's a solar system. Well, we've got to be in the middle of that solar system, surely. No, you're not. The sun is, of course. Well, we must be next to the sun. No, we're not even next to the sun. We're just an average planet. Is it significant, though? Everything in heaven, everything in the universe is looking towards that speck of dust. It's a location of significance. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, we find out that when God makes Adam and Eve, he just, just chucks them on earth, right? All the best, get to work. What did he do with them? It says that he'd made a place for them in a place called delight. The word is Eden, Eden meaning delight. He set aside this area. There was a place of great delight, and in that place he'd put a special garden for them to be located. There was a location there. We read in Genesis 3 that in the cool of the evening, God is walking in the garden looking for Adam and Eve who just sinned and were hiding. So there was a location where God was dwelling with man on earth. A location is important. God later calls Abraham out of a location and leads him to a place where he doesn't know where he's going, but he's following God, and God takes him to Canaan. And he says, this place I'm going to bring your descendants back to. I'm promising this to you. I'm setting this place apart for your descendants, the promised land. So there are places that God meets with his people, like specific mountains, this place of Luz where Jacob was sleeping at, There are places of discovery, places of correction in the Bible, places of healing, places of provision, places of worship and of prayer. I reckon that God inspires people of worship and prayer to establish places of prayer on specific locations, places where the heavens are held open and God's glory can descend, places where the forces of darkness have been pushed back and the resources of heaven can be accessed by the people of prayer in that place. That's why Jacob saw angels at work there. They were descending and ascending. Now, most of the time, if not all the time, I'm pretty sure when people plant churches, they spend quite a lot of time praying about location. When they're going to buy land or property, they take a lot of time praying about the right place. God, please lead us. We want to find the right place, not just any place. What's the place to establish this church, this house of God? So you've got to believe that God leads them to a location. Could it be that the location is the house of God, a gate to heaven where the church is planted? Hmm. Because that's what Jacob saw. In the 1950s, when people were doing mission here in Burwood, and they were looking for a location, 54 Bassett Street was the one where you're sitting today. Interesting. Interesting. I believe that those places in the open, have an open heaven and good things happen. 
But it's our ongoing prayers that widen the opening in the heavens in order that so much more of what's in heaven comes through to earth, through the house of God, that gate. Some churches have very little supernatural activity. Some churches have huge amount of supernatural activity. And we often, often ask, why? Have we understood what it means to be the house of God, the gate of heaven, where we're given the tool and the calling of prayer to say, hey, in this place, this people, when united together, they can draw things out of heaven, the resources of heaven, what you ask for and agree on together on earth shall be done by your Father in heaven. And Jacob sees it. There's angels administering servants, so called angels, ascending and descending right in that place in the top of the stairwell. There goes God. You're praying and God is giving stuff. Remember, your prayers always get through to God. But there's a battle in the heavenly realms to prevent you from receiving God's response, His supply. But in that place, it was open. And you can do more of a study. Have a look at Google um, Open Heavens in Scripture and, and see what you find. Now, this is not to say that God doesn't turn up other places or go with us wherever we go. Of course he does. But listen, there's a difference between an anointing upon you and an open heaven over you. So some of these, these terms may not be familiar to you, or the language is familiar, and you haven't quite understood what they mean. There's a difference between the anointing upon and an open heaven above. So that's why this, that God talks about that we, to be anointed, baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's upon us. Wherever you go, he's with you and upon you to empower you. But where there's an open heaven and people, God's people join there in worship and prayer, something different's going on. And that's what we're going for. Some centuries after Jacob, God had established the descendants of Abraham called Israel in the promised land of Canaan. They did come back. Now a nation and a kingdom. And eventually God gives them a king, a good king, David. David knew that God wanted Jerusalem to be the center of the kingdom of God on earth. So David began plans to build a house of God there, a temple. Good idea? Well, God said no. What? I'm pretty sure you've given me the plans already, and I'm pretty sure this is the location, the house of God. Listen to what God says. Well, King David, 1 Chronicles 28. Where are we? Here we go. King David rose to his feet and said to all the people, gathered there, listen to me, my fellow Israelites, my people. I had it in my heart to build a house as a place of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God, and I made plans to build it. But God said to me, you are not to build a house for my name because you are a warrior and have shed blood. Verse 6, and he said to me, Solomon, your son, is the one who will build my house and my courts. Verse 9, David says, and you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. So this is a call to the next generation. You getting that picture, that legacy concept? One generation to the next. Here the father saying to the son, listen, you need to know who you are and why you're here. God's chosen you. Now serve him with wholehearted devotion, with a willing mind, for the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house as the sanctuary. Breeze, be strong and do the work. David knows he's not going to build it. He's coming to the end of his life. His time is done. He's prepared all the resources. He's got the detailed plans God's revealed to him. And he passes this all on to, uh, to Solomon. And, and he says to all the um, Levites and the priests and the military commanders and all the civil leaders and all the, the engineers and, and craftsmen, he says, all of you need to serve and help in the building of this palace, of this temple of God, this house of God. David knew it was so important. That so much what he wanted to do. 
But hopefully he was pleased that the legacy was that his son would build that house. After David dies, Solomon does exactly as his father had told him to. But note, there is a special location, a location where God had appeared to David. In 2 Chronicles 3, it says, Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Aronah, Arona, the Jebusite, the place provided by David. Now that's the location that David had encountered God's mercy, and God told him to build an altar there and bring offerings. It's also the location that Abraham was taken to sacrifice his son. And God said, no, I've provided for you a lamb. And on that place, he built an altar and sacrificed the lamb. Some also believe that that's actually the place that Jacob was when he had the dream. Bit of uh, different views on that one. But it's interesting that it wasn't just a place. Hey, this looks good. It's got north-facing sun. It's got good elevation. Yeah, let's build here. Good location. No, they'd already perceived something. God is in that place. And they built the house there. Solomon is told to build the house of God, the temple here on Moriah in Jerusalem. And for many centuries since, there has been great war and conflict over that site where the Muslims have since built their most important mosque. Huge context and conflict for centuries over that place. No surprise, really, is it, that the location of the gate of heaven would be so fiercely contested. The Bible says that in the future, that Jesus will return and rule from the throne of David. Where's the throne of David? It's located in Jerusalem. There's a location. There's a place. Back to 2 Chronicles. Solomon builds the temple, the house of God, then he dedicates it. And the Levites raise their voices and praise to God and sing, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud, the cloud of his glory. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Why? Well, there's a stairwell there. There's an open heaven. And now the people will come together to the house of God. And so he comes and dwells. Are you getting the picture, church, of what this is supposed to be all about? Now listen to what Solomon prays. Chapter 6, he says to God, Have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you, that your eyes may be open day and night. Where? He's put a location to it. Towards this house the place where you've promised to set your name, that you may listen to the prayer that your servant offers towards this place. And listen to the pleas of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Listen from heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and is made to take an oath and comes and swears his oath before your altar in this house, then hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. So Solomon continues to pray, and he goes on and covering a number of possible scenarios and sins that God's people may find themselves in in the future. And he asks God to commit to hearing every prayer prayed in this place or towards this place, this house of God. So he's built the place. The glory of God fills the place, and here is his dedicating prayers. And he goes through a list. Chapter 6 goes through a list of these prayers of all these things that could happen. And if this happens, and the people turn to the house, and they turn to this place, they come to this place, and they seek you, and they pray, God, will you hear and respond? And if this happens, and they turn to this place, and they pray, will God, you hear and respond? Interesting, isn't it? If there is a famine in the land, 
If there is pestilence or bright or mildew or locust or caterpillar, if their enemy besieged them in the land of their gates, whatever COVID-19 plague, I mean, whatever sickness there is, what do you do? Well, whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man, by all your people, Israel, each knowing his own affliction and his own sorrow and stretching out his hands towards this house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of the children of mankind, that they may fear you and walk in all your ways all the days they live in the land that you gave to our fathers. So Solomon keeps asking God to consider any prayer that's prayed in that place or directed to that place, the house of God. Now they're praying to God, but in a direction, a location. So the place isn't God. we have got to make that distinction. Again and again, through chapter 6, Solomon keeps connecting the activity of two locations. That is, if people on earth pray towards this house or in this house, then the God who's dwelling in heaven, hear, forgive, bless, heal, provide, help. In this place, when people come and pray and ask for help, then God in heaven hear and respond. There's a, there's a t- connection of the two locations. Remember what Jacob saw at Bethel, a stairwell where uh, uh, angels, were, where, where angels were using that place between heaven and earth. Here in 2 Chronicles 6, Solomon has just dedicated the house of God, and here he's talking about the significance of the location. If people pray in this place or towards this place, then God hear from heaven and respond. Church, the house of God, this gateway to heaven, is supposed to be the house of prayer that connects people on earth to God in heaven. The house of God has an open heaven for prayers to ascend to God and for God's supply to descend to us. There's something significant. Any time, any place you go, you can pray and God can respond. But there's something significant about the house of God, the place God has selected, where there's already an open heaven there. You see, if you get a hold of that revelation, it changes the way you do things. Because you think, we need to get people down here and we need to pray. And things start happening. But if it's just, you know, I should pray my bedroom, it's all right. Well, that is all right. But there's something else we've been given here. A resource. This house of God. Familiar term. But Jacob saw something different. What is God's house to you? Is it a house of prayer? the gateway that accesses the presence of God and the power of God. Now, after King Solomon had finished dedicating the temple and praying to God to hear the prayers from the house of God, God appears to him. Listen to what God says in response to Solomon's prayer about the house of God. Most of you will be very familiar with this passage, but now you've got a context. 2 Chronicles 7. The Lord appears to Solomon at night and says, I've heard your prayer, and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens, closed heaven, so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know the scripture, but listen to the next verse. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I've chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. That place. Many of you would have heard that scripture before and realized how important it is for God's people to turn to God in prayer, right? Often quoted. But had you considered the context of that passage? It's all about the house of God Solomon had just built. It's a response to the dedication of the house of God. 
That's the context. We often take it out of context. It's fine to use out of that context, and, and we, we obviously know when things are going wrong in the land, the people need to return to God and pray to God. We know that. But isn't it interesting that this was all about a location? He is attentive to the prayers offered in this place. He's made a commitment to it. My eyes will be open my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Well, doesn't he see everything? Isn't he everywhere? Sure. There's a difference between the omnipresence, God everywhere, to God being somewhere, the manifest presence. That's what we're looking for. God's heart God's eyes will always be at a place, a location. Now, we know that Jerusalem is significant, absolutely, but it's more than a geographic location. It's the house of God where people gather to meet with and pray to God. That is where God's eyes and heart will always be. In other words, the place of worship and prayer always has God watching and listening. There's something relevant about a place that God has chosen to bear his name. For him to be known there, we can manifest his presence where the people come to seek him, to bring their sacrifices, to worship, and to pray. There's something about that. That's what God wants us to get a hold of. That place will have an open heaven. And we need to be wise, because if you got under an open heaven, you better ask big time for big things, because God is there to do great things. That place has angels descending and ascending with the word and provision of God. That place will see the glory of God and the provision of heaven. That place, the Bible calls, the house of prayer for all nations. When we gather here in this location to see God united in our prayers to God in heaven, he sees, he hears, and he responds. But is this a house of prayer to you? Is that what you're here for? Pause and consider. Why are you here today? What are you here for? What is Legacy Community Church to you? That's worth a bit of reflection, isn't it? What's significant about this place to you? And we could, we'd have a, a, just a vast variety of responses, and that all be good. But do you really think of this as the house of prayer? That's what the Holy Spirit wants to bring us into, a new revelation of the house of prayer for all nations. He's restoring it. And when a church becomes a house of prayer, it becomes a place of glory and miracles. What are we here for? What do we want? What do we want for the next generation? I want them to know the voice of God, the glory of God, the presence and power of God. That's why I'm committed to prayer in this place. I absolutely believe that we have access here to the throne of God, to an open heaven, to receive from God if we pray. I think we're going to see amazing things. But it's the hardest thing is to get God's people together to pray. We get together for lots of things, but prayer... That's a tough call. The enemy is completely against us joining in prayer. If he can keep us occupied with other things, that'd be great. But when the church understands who they are, as priests of the Lord, we're going to come into that, that they've been given the house of God, a place where the activity of God is so powerful. You can ask for pretty much anything, it'll be done. That's what Jesus was talking about. When we get a hold of that, now you're going to see some things. <laughs> if we pray. But wait, there's more. In Solomon's prayer in chapter 6, he also includes a curious, curious request that doesn't seem to fit the whole concept of Israel being set apart for, from other nations. Have a listen to this. This part of his prayer, he said, Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a far country for the sake of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When he comes and prays towards this house, 
Don't strike him dead. Don't judge him. Don't kick him out. Solomon doesn't pray that. He says, hear from heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you as do your people Israel and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Now, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament laws in the Bible, God was very clear to this nation, this kingdom of Israel. He said, I'm making you into my people, but to do that, I'm going to separate you from the other people. I'm consecrating, I'm setting you apart, and you're going to be holy to me. You're not to marry anyone from another race, another people group. I'm setting you apart. In fact, when you get me, get me for, um, the Apostle Peter, God says, don't call anybody unclean that God's making clean. And then he says, now go to the Gentile's house. And, and Peter protests. He says, I can't. He's a foreigner. He's a Gentile. I've never gone into a foreigner's house. That was the whole custom. We're separated from the other nations. We must never go into those other nations unless we're invading. And we must never go into their houses. We, we're not going to associate with them. And yet, what a prayer from Solomon talking about foreigners coming to the house. Now, they couldn't come inside the courts of God's house as Gentiles or foreigners, but they would come, he said, they're going to come. They're going to come to this place and pray. They're going to come to this place and they're going to look for powerful solutions to their issues. This is what Jesus was talking about when he entered the temple and found that instead of people praying, they were doing all sorts of other things, even using God's house as a trade center to make money. What does he say? He said, as he taught them, he said, is it not written? My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. So Jesus was appalled that his people no longer had clarity and value for his house as a house of prayer, but added to that tomb, house of prayer, and this is the unusual one. He adds this on. For all nations, a house of prayer for the Jews, surely, for, for Israel, surely for God's people. Yes, and for all nations. That didn't fit really with any of the Old Testament concept. Yet it comes from the Old Testament. And in fact, people did join the king of Israel from other countries. But there are rules about their association. Things they couldn't do and things they could do. God always wanted all nations. That's why with Abraham he promised to you and descendants, you're going to be a blessing to all nations. God calls his house a house of prayer for all nations. Nations meaning all people groups. Now have a listen to what he says in Isaiah 56. For this is what the Lord says, maintain justice, do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and soon my deliverance will be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this and the person that holds it fast and who observes the Sabbath without profaning it and restrains his hands from practicing any evil. Now listen to what he says next, really strange in the Old Testament term. Let no foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. Don't say that. Furthermore, let no eunuch say, look, I am just a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says to the eunuchs who observe my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and who hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will not be cut off. And foreigners, foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, those I'll bring to my holy mountain. We're back to Jerusalem again. And give them joy where? In my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples, for all nations. Hard to get our heads around the significance of that in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. This is the prophetic talk calling out. It says, this is what God's heart really is for all nations. They're going to come 
and find that the house of God is their home too. They're going to come and find that they've got access to the Father. They're going to call out to him, and he's going to hear and respond to them. What kind of house does he bring them back to? It's a house of prayer. A house of prayer. That's what this prayer series is all about. God is restoring his house of prayer, and it's for all peoples, a place where all people can come and seek God. All can come and pray and receive prayer. Now, you already know that anyway. Yeah, of course they can come in. We love them. Come on in. But it's more significant than that. It's the fact that God is building a house for his sons and daughters to come home to. But it's not any house. It's a house of what? Okay, so if you want to see them come home, you need to build a house of... Right. Now, from the word we've, world, we've learned how to do good social things. And they're important. Obviously, we've got to love people and serve them. But we're a house of prayer. When we get that part right, you see the nations come, the peoples, the different kind of people groups. You'll be surprised by the kind of people that God's going to bring in. And they're going to come up with some pretty mixed ideas that you might not agree with. He's bringing them home. He's bringing them in for you to minister to, to pray for. He's going to bring them in. They're going to come with their prayer requests. Here's where I'm at. Here's my struggle. I don't know what to do, but I've been drawn to this place. If God's real, can he help me? Who's he coming to? And do not point to me. They're coming to you. You're the ones that are called to pray for them with the power of God. That's where we're going here. This is all part of the new thing that God wants us to perceive and prepare for. This is Isaiah 43, which we've had for a few years now. Don't remember the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Watch. I'm about to carry out something new. And now it's springing up. Don't you recognize it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and paths in the desert. Wild animals, jackals and owls will honor me because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wilderness to give drink to my people, my chosen ones, the people whom I formed for myself so that they may speak my praise. Now consider the language. God is talking about his people, right? These are streams for his people. But because Israel has been provided water in the desert and streams in the wilderness, who else is coming? Wild animals, jackals, and owls will what? Honor me. Animals are coming to honor. They're joining the worship service. What's going on here? It's, it's figurative. It's talking about these wild things, these ones that don't belong, these things that are far into the house. They're coming to honor me as well. That's the new thing. He's making a way, a highway for them to return on. And there's streams that are going out of the house of God into the cities around. They're bringing life. And in those highways, people are coming back into the house, experiencing the goodness of God. The goodness of God. That's why so many of the songs at the moment have talked about the goodness of God. God is good. Why? Because that's what the world needs to hear, that your creator is real and he's good. When you get to know him, you find, man, he's only good. He's so good. Uh, where, do, where can I go to meet him? Where do they go? Come to the house of prayer. We'll introduce you. We'll pray for you. And then you can pray to him. You can know him. But it has to be a house of prayer. In a few weeks' time, I'm going to talk about the priests of the Lord. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. A royal priesthood. He's called you to be a priesthood. We need to find out what does that mean? But the house of God, it's a gate to heaven. There's some cool things going on there. It's going to be called a house of prayer, so we want to get that right. And then we're priests in the house. I don't get it. What does that mean? We've got to start killing goats and sheep. What's going to happen? We're going to be looking at that and I think we're going to be surprised by some of the things that God has called us to and the provisions that we've been given in this house. For now, I want you to seek and receive a fresh vision of the house of God, the gate of heaven, as a house of prayer for all, for all peoples. 
rather than looking for professionals to pray for the sick, the, the, the depressed, the brokenhearted, the lost. God is anointing you, Isaiah 61 says. He's anointing you to pray for the people he's bringing in and you to see the power and grace of God administered. He's raising you up to minister to that generation. It starts, though, with being a house of prayer. So let's finish this morning again with the vision and the role description we've been given in Isaiah 61. Remember, when praying, one of the most powerful things you can do is to use the Word of God in prayer. And sometimes it's a, it's, a, it's a scripture that has an ask. Sometimes it's a scripture that has a declaration. Just like God said, let there be light, and there was light. And the, the speaking of the Word, the declaration of it has power. Isaiah 61 is just a great prayer that you can use. It's a great declaration over you and the generation to come. Will you pray it with me? The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Now watch what happens in the next two verses that we haven't been looking at yet. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Oh, that's curious. What's that about? The thing that flows on from a generation that has been redeemed, transformed, and sent out to rebuild, restore, and renew cities is that strangers and foreigners start turning up. People who didn't belong in the house. People who didn't seem to think, set us, didn't seem to conform to the way we think or the way we see things. It just didn't look like they're the right people. God starts bringing them in. All peoples. All nations. And guess what they find? Priests and ministers. Any priests here? You're just going to start putting all your hand up in a couple of weeks. Priests. A holy priesthood. A royal priesthood. He's making us into something. Encourage you. I was going to say read Leviticus. You should read Leviticus. But... um, Maybe just have a quick scan through, and you start to see that's kind of like the manual for the priesthood and the Levites. But you have a look through Exodus and find out this establishment of the, of the line of Levi, the Levites, and the priesthood under Aaron. And start familiar, familiarizing yourself with those concepts. What does it mean to be a priest of the Lord? Well, that's what we're going to get into.